Good afternoon if you're on the East Coast, or good morning, or good evening, depending on where you're calling in from around the world. I am so thrilled that you've cho chosen to join us today for this webinar with Hiram Smith on the topic of his brand new book, which is launching today, The Three Gaps, Are You Making a Difference? Hiram, welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here. Where are you calling in from today? Maybe you can let our listeners know. I am calling in from my home in southwestern Utah. I'm only 100 miles from Las Vegas. I'm on a little ranch here, and this is a little bit of heaven, actually. Oh, wow. I wish I could transport and be with you in Utah today, but I'm so thrilled that we have the chance to learn and grow together. As we begin today's event, I guess I should pause for a second and introduce myself. I'm Becky Robinson, and uh, many of you maybe have attended our events in the past. I want to tell you a few technical details related to today's event. So first of all, um, you are looking at the slide for today's event, um, and so if it doesn't move, that's okay. Okay, we're going to have Hiram front and center with his content today. We will have time at the end of today's events for questions, so please feel free to use that question panel, and we're going to reserve a lot of time at the end so that those questions that you really want to ask Hiram, you'll have that opportunity to do so. We would also love to have you participate live today via social media and share tweets with the hashtag that you see on your screen, the three gaps. And in case you're wondering about Hiram's Twitter handle, it's pretty easy. It's his name, at Hiram W. Smith, and you can find that his name on the slide as well. Just remember to include that W so all those tweets come back to Hiram. Um, so as we are getting started, I would love the chance to welcome you and also to have you um, put some information in the question panel so we can see that you know how to use it. And uh, so if, if you're calling in from, I don't know, Europe or Africa or Asia or somewhere amazing, or if you're calling in from one of the beautiful states in the U.S. or from Canada, we would love to hear where you're calling in from and get you to try out the question panel. Looks like we have Scott from Tampa. We have Ohio, California. Washington, D.C., Alabama, Florida, Texas, Philadelphia, Canada, oh my goodness, these are so fast, Colorado, and happy 2016 to all of you. Um, we have someone calling in from Panama, uh, Minnesota, almost every state in the union. Jim, glad you're here, glad you're excited to hear about the new book. Um, thank you so much for all of you who are investing this hour in this hour with us. And uh, wow, uh, everyone's saying hello. Thank you so much for being here with us. And uh, uh, I know that we're all going to have just a rich time of learning together today. Hiram told me that he prefers short introductions. And so I'm going to keep his introduction short. As you all know, he's the author of this brand new book, The Three Gaps, Are You Making a Difference? And it, it encompasses a lot of the learning and teaching that Hiram has been doing over the past 40 years. And you might best know Hiram for his work on the Franklin Day Planner and his work founding and leading um, that Franklin Covey or Franklin Quest company. So um, I'm going to keep it brief because Hiram prefers that and move right on into the content. And uh, I'll be back with you toward the end of this hour for questions. Hiram, thank you so much for being here. All right. Thank you very much, Becky. Well, first of all, let me welcome everybody that's here. I'm uh, honored, frankly, that uh, you would take your time to be with me today. Uh, when I realize that there are people watching this from different parts of the world, that's, a, that's, a, that's an awesome responsibility. I take that very seriously. We're going to accomplish in less than an hour today what normally takes three hours. Are you excited? <laughs> so I'm going to ask you to do three things for me today. If you do these three things for me, because I'd like to make this a meaningful experience, the three things I'm going to ask you to do are these. Number one, I'm going to ask you to take some notes. We you just put something in front of you, you could jot some notes on. I'm going to be very specific about what I ask you to write. We've discovered that people have to hear something at least six times before it affects their behavior. I figure if you see it, write it, hear it, we're halfway there. So number one, will you jot a couple of things down? Number two, I'm going to ask you to think about what I share with you on this webinar today for 36 hours. Just think about it. Three, I'm going to ask you to teach what you've written on your notes today to some other person within 48 hours of now. It's going to be a friend, associate, spouse, significant other, teenager, somebody on the bus. Just grab somebody and teach them what you've written down. If you'll do these three things for me, I'll promise you a major shift in how you make your personal and professional decisions and a major shift and increase in your personal and professional productivity. 
That's a big promise to make before I've said anything, but I have the opportunity of sharing this information with people all over the world, and I know it works, if you'll just do those three things. Now let me introduce <clears throat> what I'm going to share with you today with this experience. And the first thing I'm going to ask you to write. Because I've been involved in time management all these years, I've had over the last 40 years literally hundreds of people come up to me before, after a presentation, and it's really interesting. They'll always lower their voice and they'll, they'll look around and make sure nobody's listening. And then they'll say, you know, Hiram, I wish I lived 100 years ago when they had more time. And I said, really? How much more time do they have? Oh, they had a lot more time. Do you know what the only difference is between today and 100 years ago? We have more options than they had. Why do we have more options? Because we're into speed. That's why. We're in, we do stuff fast. If my grandfather missed a train, no big deal. 24 hours, he'd catch another train. If my father missed an airplane, no big deal. Five hours, catch another airplane. If I miss one section of a revolving door, I go nuts. And so do you. And why do we do that? Because we're into speed, that's why. Now I'm going to make a statement. I want you to listen first, and I would ask you to write this down and and commit this to memory. Listen first. The basic principles that help a human being become more productive and effective have not changed for 6,000 years. Let me say that again while you write it down. The basic principles that help a human being become more productive and effective have not changed for 6,000 years. Every generation has to rediscover these principles. We give new names to them. We write books about them. A good friend of mine wrote a book. I, we merged our companies in 1997. Seven Habits of Stuff. I wrote a book. What Matters Most? Read either book. There's not a new idea in either book. It's criminal, really. We make money at that stuff. How many of you have ever heard of the book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People? Let me share one of the seven habits of highly effective people with you. Here, This is a little heavy for this early on a, on a Monday morning, but here comes one of the seven habits of highly effective people. Be proactive. Whoa. It gives you goosebumps, doesn't it? 6,000-year-old idea. You want to hear another one? Here comes another one of the seven habits of highly effective people. Hold on to your hat. First things first. Whoa. Just makes the hair stand up on your head. 6,000-year-old idea. And a guy named Covey comes along, puts seven of them together, and says these are seven habits of highly effective people. And the world went nuts. Now what's the magic? There's magic in that book. What's the genius? Stephen Covey is a genius. The genius was putting the seven together. The genius was how they are taught for the 21st century. But the basic principle that help you and me become better, more productive, effective, you and me, haven't changed for a very long time. Now, I make an issue of that before we start today, because what I'm going to be sharing with you today happens to be some really old stuff very relevant to today because what has not changed in the last 100, 500 years? You and me. We're folks. We still get about out of bed in the morning. We've got to put our pants on one leg at a time, go to the bathroom a couple times a day. We're folks. Now, what has changed? Our environment is changing. The tools with which we implement these principles are changing at warp speed. But the basic principles, that help us be better, go back a very long way. Now, with that said, let me tell you a really interesting thing. I, I was raised, and I think most of us were raised with the idea that if we really worked hard and put our nose to the grindstone, at some point we earned the right to be happy. And you know, we spent our life quest wanting and trying to be happy. Intuitively, I think we've always known that that's backwards, that happiness has to come and then productivity goes off the map. 
we now know that for a fact by research, actually a lot of Harvard research, university done research, that people that are happy inside are the most productive people on the planet. Well, what is it then that causes somebody to be happy? And you know, one of the things that I've taught all these years is the, this whole idea of inner peace and by bringing what we do, what we matter and what we do in line with what matters to us, we have a right to this thing called inner peace. Well, inner peace is a foundation of happiness and when we achieve happiness, all of a sudden we discover that we're wanting to and making a difference on the planet. And when people make a difference and believe and feel and are in fact making a difference, you don't have to tell them to get out of bed in the morning. They do it automatically. Their productivity goes off the mat. In fact, you know the most productive period of American history was during the Second World War. And now why? Everybody in this country felt like they were making a difference. They were part of the effort. And so I'm going to make a case today for happiness coming first. About a year ago, a colleague of mine approached me and said, Hiram, all the stuff you've been teaching for the last 40 years can all be wrapped up into one simple idea. I said, really, what is that? And he said, it's closing gaps. That's all you've ever talked about. He said, there are three big gaps. You've been talking about it for 40 years. You need to put them in a book. Let's do the book. And let's even start a company and, and get the message out. So we've done that. In fact, today's an exciting day. The book actually lands in bookstores today. And the title of the book is The Three Gaps. These are the three gaps. I'm going to here. There's the belief gap. I'm going to give you a quick and dirty on each gap, and then I'm going to deep, burrow down a little deeper on each one. The belief gap asks this question. Is there a gap between what I believe to be true and what is actually true? And if there's a gap between what I believe is true and what is actually true, I've got a problem. For example, if I believe that gravity doesn't work, I'm going to be in real trouble. So the challenge of bringing my belief system in line with reality is critical. Because when there's gaps, there's pain. We'll come back to that one. The second gap is the time gap. And the question here is, is there a gap between what I did today and what I said I'd do today? And if there's a gap there, I have a problem. We'll share a blueprint with you on how to close that gap. The third gap is the value gap. I'm going to spend a little time on this at the end. This is a really important one to me. They're all important, but this one to me is, is a big one. The question of the value gap is, is there a gap between what I'm doing and what matters most to me, what I value? For example, if I value being physically fit, but I weigh 350 pounds. I'm in pain. Why? There's a gap between what I'm doing and what I really value. If I value being financially OK and I'm $500,000 in debt, I'm in pain. If I want inner peace, ultimately happiness, I've got to close the gap. We'll share a blueprint with you on how to close the gap. So that's what the book is all about. And that's what this webinar is about. about closing three powerful gaps, the belief gap, the time gap, and the value gap. In your notes, go to a clean sheet of paper if you've got one, and let me introduce a quick blueprint on the belief gap. We discovered a model a lot of years ago when I was at Franklin, and I, I'm, I'm hoping many of you remember the old Franklin planner before the digital devices came out. You know, just about everybody had a Franklin planner. It was pretty exciting. It was a fun ride. And there are actually a lot of people still using paper planners, which is kind of neat. The belief model that we discovered quite a few years ago has five pieces to it. I want you to write this model down in your notes so that you'll have it because this is the model that will help you close the belief gap. Will you start on your sheet of paper by drawing a circle about the size of a 50 cent piece? When you've created that circle, come up on top of it and label the circle with the words human needs human needs. Then quadrify the circle. Make it look like the scope on a rifle. Now understand this fact. As each of you sit here today, you have four powerful driving human needs. Whether you think you've got these or not, you've got them, folks. We all have them. I'm going to ask you to write one of these needs in each of the four quadrants of the circle. The first need is 
to live, survival. The second need is to love and be loved. The third need is to feel important, to have value. The fourth need, and this is the most interesting one to me, but the fourth need is variety. Variety. That's why you're wearing different color clothes, you go on vacations, you buy a remote for your television set. These four basic needs everyone has. Will you now draw a square right next to the needs wheel? Make the square the same size as the needs wheel. Come up on top of that square and label it with the words belief window. Belief window. Inside of that box, will you write two words? Will you write the words beliefs and principles? I'm going to use those words interchangeably. You'll see why in just a minute. Now understand this fact. As each of you sit here today, you have what I like to call a belief window. It sits in front of your face. It's about this big. A wire comes from the back of your head across the top, hooks onto the belief window. Every time you move, it goes with you. You look out into the world through this window. You accept information from the world in through this window. On this window, you have placed thousands of principles and beliefs that you have accepted as correct beliefs. And then I say the word principles, a lot of people start thinking about heavy-duty religious stuff, and that's probably there, and that's okay. But there are thousands of little tiny principles as well. We put principles on our belief windows because we believe they'll help satisfy those four needs. The number of principles you have on your belief window is a function of your age. <laughs> That's kind of how it is. The older you are, the more you have. Now, I'm going to give you an example of a principle you might have on your belief window. You give me the, the need driving this principle. Here is a principle. All Doberman Pinschers are vicious. Which of the four needs to drive a principle? Well, I have a need to survive, so I put a principle on my belief window. All big dogs, Doberman Pinschers, are vicious. I believe that. All right, let's put up the third piece of the model. Draw another square. Make it the same size as the belief window square. Come up on top of this square and label it with the word rules. Rules. Inside of this box, write two small words. Will you write the words if and then? If then. Now here's how it works. The minute you put a principle or belief on your belief window, you immediately, automatically start to set up rules that will govern your behavior based on the principle on your belief window. We call these if-then rules. Now here's how it works. I have the principle on my belief window, all Doberman Pinschers are vicious. If that's true then, I set up my rules. The rules are automatic. Go to somebody's yard, there's a big dog, what will I do? I'll leave tall buildings with a single bound. I'll run, evade. I'll have a very specific set of rules all set up based on the principle on my belief window. Now understand this fact. The first three pieces of the model are all invisible. You can't see it. No one else can see it. But it's going on every second you breathe. Put up the fourth piece of the model. Draw another square. So you have a circle, two squares. Draw a third square now, so you have four pieces. On top of this third square, label it with the words behavior pattern. Behavior patterns. Inside of this square, would you write the word action? Action. We now start to move. We function. We get out of bed in the morning. We show up at work. Let's go back to that same principle. All Doberman Pinschers are vicious. If that's true, then we set up a rule. The rules are automatic. Go in somebody's yard. There's a big dog. What behavior pattern do we see? You will do the same thing every single time. All right, I'm going to give you another principle now. You think about the need driving this, and let's take it through the model to this point. Here is a principle. And by the way, I'm going to give you a lot of principles today. I want you to ask yourself this question. Do I know anyone that has that principle on their belief window? Are you with me? Okay, here is a principle. My self-worth is dependent on my possession. Do you know anybody that has that belief on their belief window? Let's pretend I have that principle in my belief window. My self-worth is dependent on my possessions. Let's pretend 
I have a second principle on my belief window, and the second principle is European possessions are better. So I have two principles on my belief window. My self-worth is dependent on my possessions, and European possessions are better. Let's put up the fourth, the final, the fifth piece of the model and see how this works. Draw a final square. It's the fourth square, but the fifth piece of the model. Up on top of that, label it with the word results. Results. Now drop a line from the bottom of the results box down about an eighth of an inch, draw it back underneath the model, and poke it up into the needs wheel. You've just connected the needs wheel and the results box with a line. Label that line with the word feedback. I'm now going to ask you to write two laws that will help you understand why this model works. Write this law. Listen to it first. If the results of your behavior do not meet your needs, there is an incorrect principle on your belief window. Write it really fast. If the results of your behavior do not meet your needs, there is an incorrect principle on your belief window. Second law, results take time to measure. Results take time to measure. All right, let's go back to that same one. I have the belief on my belief window. My self-worth is dependent on my possessions, and European possessions are better. If that's true, then I set up my rules. Rules are automatic. It's now time for me to buy a car. What kind of car will I drive? What kind of clothes will I wear? You see what I'm saying? Now, here's another one. Let me give you another principle that take it all the way through the model. My self-worth is dependent on never losing an argument. Do you know anybody who has that principle on their belief window? Let's pretend you know somebody named George, and George has that principle on his belief window. My self-worth is dependent on never losing an argument. If that's true, then George sets up his rules. Rules are automatic. He now gets in an argument with his 15-year-old son. What behavior pattern will we see from George? Death to the son. He will win every single time. Now we have to ask the question, will the results of George's behavior meet his needs over time? Yes or no? If the answer is no, that means he has a bad principle on his belief window. Let me take it, let me give you a heavy one now. I'm going to address all the men out there listening, I want the women to listen very carefully. I'm going to give the men a principle you might have on your belief window or know another guy that has this on their belief window. Women, I want you to tell me which of the four needs would drive this principle. Here is the principle. Men are better than women. Do you know any men that have that principle on their belief window? Do you know any women that have that principle on their belief window? Ladies, which of the four needs would drive a principle like that? Survival? <laughs> Feel important? Whatever? Think about that. If a guy has that principle on his belief window, men are better than women, what kind of behavior will that drive? How will he treat women in the workplace? How will he treat his daughters in his home? This is the point I'm trying to make. What we have on our belief windows has a dramatic impact, total impact, on how we behave. Now, I'm going to ask you to write two more laws really fast. Growth is a process of changing principles on our belief windows. Growth is the process of changing principles on our belief windows. Ladies and gentlemen, Corporate America spends $85 billion a year training their people. Why? What, why do they send people to training? Why do people go to webinars? If you go to a training experience of any kind and come away from it without at least one new principle or belief on your belief window, or at least validated principles that are already there, you've wasted your time and your money. That's why we do it. I taught time management seminars at Merrill Lynch Company for many, many years, and I shared this with the senior training person there about in the early 90s, and 
she got quite excited about it. She said, Hunter, all the training we do at Maryland is designed to better improve the behavior and productivity of our people. I said, yeah. She said, what that really means is we're trying to get new and better principles on their belief windows so they can govern themselves. A huge idea. Number four, really important. If your self-worth is dependent on anything external, you are in big trouble. If your self-worth is dependent on anything external, you're in big trouble. You know, I, we get some weird stuff on our belief windows. Can I share a fun experience? I was in Boston a lot of, many years ago, and a fellow was there. He was an attorney. How do I know he's an attorney? He told me. He was a fifth generation of attorneys in that family in Boston. He hated being an attorney. After he went through this belief window model, he approached his wife and said, you know, my needs are not being met by being an attorney. I hate being an attorney. 49 years old, big six-figure income. He said to his wife, do you know what I really want to do? I want to teach music at Boston College. What do you think his wife said? Have you lost your mind? He said, hey, if I make this major career change at this point in my life, will you still love me? Well, of course I'll love you. I'll miss you. <laughs> you know, do you know what? The guy made the change. He He's now teaching music at Boston College. He cut his income by a factor of eight, and he's happier than he's ever been in his life. Is that possible? We get some really weird stuff on our belief windows about money, do we not? Here's the last law I want you to write. Here's the last law. And this is where the gap closes. This is how the gap closes. When the results of your behavior do meet your needs over time, you experience inner peace. Please write that down. When the results of your behavior do meet your needs over time, you experience inner peace. This is not rocket science. This is a very simple, old, powerful principle. We close the belief gap by identifying beliefs that will bring inner peace and happiness into our lives. Now the fact is, everybody out there has a belief window that's covered with belief. Some are good, some probably aren't. What I'm suggesting in the book is, get an industrial strength vat of Windex and clean up your belief window. The model helps you do that in the book. Let's go to the second gap now, the time gap. The time gap is, this one is, a, I've taught this for 40 years. But that's what we did the Franklin model around. And the question here again, is there a gap between what I did today and what I said I do today? The menu here, or the blueprint here is really simple, but there is one very important point I have to make, and that is, when you hear someone say, I don't have time, you have just heard the biggest lie on the planet. There's no such thing as not having enough time. Now, why do I say that? Well, initially, some people get offended by that, but let me tell you. The fact is, you and I have the exact same amount of time. We give, we're given a check for 24 hours every single day. We have to spend every second. We're not going to get one more, nor can we save any. That's just the way it is. You know, the two fallacies of time that we get hooked into believing, somehow I'm going to get more of it, and somehow I can save it somehow. Not true. We all have 24 hours. That means when you say to someone, I don't have time, what you're really saying, and boy, if you don't remember a thing I've said today, Remember this, what you're really saying is, I value some other event more. I value something else more. If we understand what time is, Einstein had the best definition for time. He said, time is the occurrence of the events in sequence, one after the other. The dictionary tells us that management is the act of controlling. So put those two together. What's time management? The act of controlling events. Huh. So the question next is, well, what are the events over which I have any control? 
we talk about a little simple model in the book of you know identifying these are events I have no control these are I have total control in between partially controlled events am I smart enough to know the difference so when I say to my son when he so when I come home and he says dad play catch with me and I say I really don't have time son what I'm really saying is son I'd rather go in the house and read the newspaper than play catch with my son. If we get that in our brain, I mean, you know, when somebody says to you, hey, would you have lunch with me? It's not okay to say, actually, I value something else more than having lunch with you, so I'm not going. <laughs> not cool to say that. But be careful, because that's what you're saying. As we realize that, here's the blueprint for closing the time gap. And if, if I could get you to do this, if you didn't do anything else as a result of this webinar today, if you did this one thing, the impact in your life, professionally, personally, would blow you away. Commit to spending 10 to 15 minutes every single day formally planning your day. Now you think, well, how simple is that? You know, that's really simple. That's been an idea around for 6,000 years. 92% of the executives in America, men and women, don't take time to plan their day. And do you know what most of them say is the reason why they don't plan their day? I don't have time. Ah! I'll shoot myself. I don't have time to plan my day. Those are one of the events, frankly, over which you have total control. Now, why is the plan so important? A lot of people say, you know, the reason I don't waste time planning my day is because I'm going to be interrupted all day. I got emails coming in by the thousands. I'm a fireman for crying out loud. I've got a buzzer going off. I've got to go fight a fire. So why bother planning? Here's why. If you have a plan and the unexpected happens to you, which it does, we used to call them interruptions. I like to, I like to call them. I like to call it the, the unexpected. When the unexpected happens, if you don't have a plan, you've got to do the unexpected. You don't have a choice. You don't have an option. If you've created the plan, you have an option. The plan is the option. The unexpected is an option. And now you have to make a choice. Which is the most valuable to me right now, the plan or the unexpected? And let me tell you, sometimes the unexpected wins, sometimes the plan wins. It's okay. At the end of the day, you know that you did what was the most important for you. So on the time gap, and again, we get into it deeper in the book, but you know, for the time gap, if I could get you to do that one thing, commit. Early morning, late at night, doesn't matter. Just so you have 10 to 15 minutes, isolated from the world, no emails, no nothing, just you and yourself. Have a moment of, of solitude, if you will, peace, quiet. And then ask the question, what's the most important things I can do today? And then create your list. This is not rocket science. Okay, let's go to the third gap. Now, the third gap, ladies and gentlemen, I, is really important for me to spend the time on because this is a very important gap, the value gap. Remember the question here was, is there a gap between what I do and what I value most? If I value being physically fit, I weigh 400 pounds, I'm in pain. How do I close the value gap? I will tell you from personal experience and watching many, many, many people that when there's a gap there between what I'm doing and what I really value, I am in excruciating pain, emotional, psychological, physical, spiritual. There's all kinds of different pain, but there's pain. The blueprint for closing this gap is really simple. I'm going to ask you to write it down. There are three steps to the blueprint of closing this gap. Then I'm going to ask you to write a significant commitment on the value gap. All right, here we go. Step number one in closing the value gap identify my governing values. Write it in the first person, identify my governing values. So the first thing we're going to do in closing this gap is we're just going to write down, make a list of all our governing values. Now, to help you with this, this is, it sounds easy, this is not easy. And because it's not easy, I'm going to walk you through a quick scenario 
that will help you reach inside and discover one of your governing values. Now, if we were together in a big room, and I've done this with literally hundreds of groups, and it's, very, it's a very compelling experience for me. But let's pretend one of you out there's name is Fred. And Fred has let me know that he has a daughter, two years old, by the name of Amanda. And so I say to Fred, Fred, out here in front of this building we're in, there's an I-beam 300 feet long on the ground. I'm going to put you at one end of the I-beam. I'm going to get at the other end of the I-beam. And we're going to let everybody in this webinar line up on both sides of the I-beam just to see what you do. Now, in case you don't know what an I-beam is, it's a steel beam shaped like a capital I if you cut it in half. So Fred gets at one end of the I, I get the other. And then I take out of my wallet a $100 bill. And I shout at Fred and I say, Fred, if you come across this I-beam without stepping off either side, get here in two minutes, I'll give you $100. Would you come? Fred thinks about it for about two nanoseconds and says, absolutely. I say, OK, great. Now we're going to take the same I-beam put it on the back of a long flatbed truck. This is some truck. We're going to drive it over to the north rim of the Grand Canyon. I don't know if you've ever been to the north rim of the Grand Canyon, but there are places there, 300 feet across, 1,100 feet straight down. We're going to bolt the I-beam into both walls, perfectly safe. It will not fall. The I-beam is now bowed just a little because of the distance, and it's raining. Not raining very hard. It's kind of a thick mist, and there's a wind about 40 miles an hour. And I shout at, you know, like Fred on the other wall, I'm on this wall, I shout at Fred and I say, hey, if you'll come across the I-beam without stepping off either side, get here in two minutes, I'll give you $100. Would you come now? Fred thinks about two nanoseconds and says, no way, I'm not coming for it. I said, okay, now I have $10,000. Unmarked bills, Fred. Would you risk it for $10,000? No way. All right, now I have $50,000. Would you risk it for $50,000? Fred thinks about it for a minute and says, no, I don't think so. All right, Fred, now I have $1 million. The I-beam is four inches long. The rain is up. The wind's blowing a little harder, 1,100 feet straight down. Would you risk that I-beam for $1 million? Fred thinks about it for a little longer now, but he says, I don't think so. And I say, all right, Fred, I'm going to be a, one more time, I'm going to change the scenario. I'm not a nice guy anymore. I have your two-year-old daughter, Amanda, over the edge by the hair on my side. And I say, Fred, if you don't get across that I-beam right now, I'll drop your daughter. Would you come now? This time, Fred, a little emotional, says, you're darn right I'd come right now, and I'd kill you when I got on the other side. We just discovered, ladies and gentlemen, one of Fred's governing values. And that governing value is, I love my child. Money has value. Safety has value. But a greater value is the love of the child. He would probably risk the I-beam for the child. That is what governing values are really all about. I did this once with a woman that had a teenager. They will not come across for a teenager. <laughs> it's a true story. Man, I was in San Diego. I had the kid over the edge. She said, drop him. I said, drop him. <laughs> Ruined my whole story. Now, you get the point? What, what we're discovering is what our values really are. Now, the reason I take you through this is so important. When you sit down to do step one of this blueprint of closing this gap, will you ask yourself this question? And please write this question down. What would I cross the I-beam for? What principle, idea, person, value, has so much value to me that I would risk, maybe even dedicate, 
my life to the value. What we're talking about is coming face to face with what really matters most to me. All right, that's step one. Now let's go to step two in this blueprint for closing the value gap. Step two is this. Write a clarifying statement for each value. Write a clarifying statement for each value. We now give vision and clarity to each one of these values by writing a statement describing what they mean to us. Step number three, prioritize the value. Prioritize the value. Now why would I ask you to prioritize a list like this? Let me tell you a quick experience. In 1925, in Indianapolis, Indiana, there was a man by the name of Herman Craner, senior executive with the Sefton Container Company. He was summoned to Chicago to have lunch with the president of the company. He got pretty excited about that. He never met the president. So he came to Chicago, sitting down at the athletic club, they're having lunch, and the president says to Herman Craner, Herman, we're going to make an announcement in the company this afternoon that greatly impacts your life. We're going to promote you to a senior executive vice president and you're to be the newest member of the board of directors. Well, Craner was blown away. He said, Mr. President, I didn't even know I was being considered for this. And then Craner said to the president, you know, Mr. President, I want you to know. I will be the most loyal employee this company has ever had. I will dedicate my life to making this the finest corporation in America. The president was very gratified by that. He said, Herman, I'm glad you mentioned that because there is one thing I'd like you to remember. As a member of the board of directors, you will vote exactly the way I tell you to. Well, this kind of took the wind out of Craner's sail. He says, well, I'm not sure I can do that. Ah, wait a minute, Craner. that's the way it is in the business world. I put you on the board, you do what I tell you, right? The more he thought about that, the angrier he became. At the end of lunch, he stood up and said, you know, Mr. President, I can't accept this promotion. I don't want to be a puppet for anybody on a board of directors. And then he said, not only that, I don't think I want to work for a company where that takes place. I quit. He came back to Indianapolis that night, approached his wife. You'll be excited to know. Today I was promoted to be a senior executive vice president. They put me on the board of directors, and I quit. And she said, you quit? Have you lost your mind? He said, told, he stopped her and he said, wait a second, let me tell you what happened. He told her what happened. She was very supportive. She said, well, I guess we'll have to find something else. Four nights later, six senior executives from the Sefton Container Company burst through the front door of his home, all excited. Herman, we heard about what happened the other day. We think that's the coolest thing we've ever heard. Not only that, we quit too. What do you mean you quit too? Yeah, we quit too. And you want to hear the good news? We're going to go to work for you. He said, how are you going to work for me? I don't have a job. Well, we figured you'd find something, and when you do, we're going to go to work for you. That night, those seven guys sat down around a dining room table in 1925 and created the Inland Container Corporation. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if you have never heard of the Inland Container Corporation, it's probably good. it was sold a few years ago for about $10 billion. It's a multi-billion dollar empire today because a guy in 1925 not only knew what his governing values were, one of them was loyalty. Another was integrity. How had he prioritized them? Suppose he had changed the order of those two values would it have affected his decision? Ladies and gentlemen, this is the most important list you will ever prioritize. You're going to have to do that on your own time.
Now I'm going to ask you a question, and then I'm going to ask you for a pretty strong commitment. Here's the question. What do you suppose the Constitution of the United States, or any republic, but we'll use the United States, what do you suppose the Constitution of the United States is to the people of the United States? Isn't that our set of values as a people? No law in this country is ever ratified until it's measured against our set of values for consistency. In 1787, six years after the end of the revolution, they sat in a meeting in Philadelphia yelling at each other. They just won the revolution. And they asked themselves the question, what would we cross an I-beam for? Hadn't they just crossed a hellacious I-beam, the Revolutionary War? Principles, values, ideas started to surface. Things like the freedom of speech and religion and all the rest of it. So there'd be no question in anyone's mind what those values meant. They clarified every one of them in the written statement. That became the Constitution of the United States. Now here's the commitment. I'm going to ask you to spend five to seven hours creating your personal Constitution. When you've gone through these three steps, ladies and gentlemen, you have in fact written your own personal Constitution. The impact it'll have on you will blow you away. Uh, I, I, I'm going to tell you one really fast story. I shared this with a, a lot of people at the Merrill Lynch Company. A senior guy at that company, 25 years ago, wrote me a letter one year after he had decided to write his own constitution. And this is what he told me in his letter. He said, Hiram, a year ago it never occurred to me that what I do every day ought to be based on my own personal constitution. So I took your challenge and I wrote my personal constitution. He said, I discovered as a result of that that one of my governing values was providing a good life for my son. When I admitted that to myself, I had to admit I wasn't doing anything for my son. I was on the road all the time. I rarely saw him, didn't help him with his homework. I want you to know this last year I have spent my year dedicating my life to making my son's life amazing. And then he spent two or three pages describing the neat things he'd done with this kid over the last year. On the last page of the letter to me, he said, Hiram, last week my son, nine years old, was killed in a car accident. He said, Hiram, I've experienced a lot of pain at the loss of my son, but I have not had to experience any guilt. And then he said, thank you. Now think about that. Here he had gone through a tragic, ugly experience, but because he had lived his values, He'd done what mattered most to him. He didn't have to go into any guilt when he lost that kid. It can be that big. Now, I've gone over this really fast. We're out of time. We're going to get to questions, but three gaps. The belief gap, there's a menu. The belief model helps close the gap. The time gap, planning every single day, you'll discover that the plan will trump the unexpected more often than you think it will. The value gap, Write your personal constitution. If you want to have a real experience, we'll do a constitution for your family. Do one with your significant other, your spouse. It's electric. Okay, I've gone over my time. You know, we need to have a little few minutes for uh, questions and answers. I encourage you to get the book. The, the content there really has the impact of changing your life. Becky, we're back. Um, so Ed is wondering if you could share with us, Hiram, and clarify the difference between the belief gap and the value gap. Okay, the, the belief gap is important in all three. If our belief system is not in line, then our value gaps will generally be pretty messed up. Okay, if, if we, for example, if the word integrity, what does that mean to us? If we have a definition of integrity for ourselves, it goes on our belief window, then it will start driving behavior that matches up with the closing the value gap. So the belief gap, the reason we start with the belief gap, because it plays a role in all three gaps. That helps. And Ed, if you uh, have any clarifying question, please feel free to share. Um, Paul is wondering about how you see time management and that whole world changing. You referenced earlier the paper planners. People still use them. I'm one person who doesn't. Um, talk to us a little bit about how kind of the time management world has changed with the advent of people using electronic systems. Well. 
The interesting thing is the basic principles of managing time have not changed for 6,000 years. The tools that we're using are changing dramatically. We created a paper planner. And this was before iPods or, or any of the electronic devices, before PCs, before iPhones. And the, the Franklin Planner was a marvelous tool. What we taught in that was plan your day, create a daily task list, make sure you know what your appointments are, and then take notes so that you make a record of every commitment that you make or accept and know how to find that information. The Franklin Planner was a wizard at doing that. Those principles are still critical today, only we have fancy devices now. We have our, our iPads and our iPhones and our PCs and they help us do that, quite frankly, for doing tasks and appointments during the day just for me. A paper planner is faster, but I can't share a paper planner with my colleagues, so there's some problems with that. So the point I would make here is the basic principles that you'll see in the book for time management haven't changed and will never change. You just need to bring those principles into whatever device you're using. In fact, at Franklin, I, I used to be have everything in one place. It was your Franklin planner. All we did was change one word, have everything in one system. And that could be a paper planner, an iPhone, a PC, an iPad, or whatever, and, or a combination of all of the above. Got it. So an interesting comment here from Jessie. Um, she said after many years of using a paper Franklin planner, she's now using one again, and she thinks the magic is available, and it's in the writing it down. And I know, I mean, I'm still writing things down, too, so there's power there. Um, so here's a question that came from Angie Hiram, and she's wondering, you know, why you recommend planning 10 minutes a day rather than having a big block of time to plan for an entire week? I, I do not suggest you don't do the week. I recommend both. But what I've discovered is we live by days, not by weeks. And so having the weekly plan is absolutely a good idea, and I totally recommend that. But you need to follow that up with a daily plan and see how am I going to fit what I said I was going to do this week into my daily plan. What happens with a lot of people, they do the weekly plan, and if I don't do the daily plan, then I end up with, the, you know, reacting to the unexpected, and I don't get the weekly plan done. So I, I am a big fan of the weekly plan, but you've got to do the daily plan as well. Got it. Okay, thanks. So here's a question about values and prioritizing values. Uh, Rachel is wondering how we balance between two really important values in our life, like, for example, children and work and, you know, other routine tasks. And also, uh, this is kind of an add-on, and uh, you can answer in whatever order you like, but she is also wondering how we can know if we're over-planning or whether we're being unrealistic about what we can accomplish with the time we have. Well, let me answer the first question first. I think if you're doing the daily plan and you're, you're in sync doing it every day, your gut will automatically tell you when you're over planning a day. You can tell. That's why you, you know, I've got 11 hours of stuff to do today. I only have eight. I'd better not do that till Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. Mm -hmm. And so you will build reality into your plan automatically because you'll just know. I will tell you, you'll just know. And the other thing on on the uh, on how do I tell which is more important? One of the things that we have done is we've created a game. This is going to be released pretty quick uh, on each of the gaps. And, and there's, for example, a value gap game, and it helps you discover what your values are, put them in the priority that you want, and actually helps you write the paragraph describing what it means. Because one of the things you've got to ask yourself, you may come up with, let's say I have 10 values, and I would never you know, suggest what your values ought to be or anyone, but I have discovered that there are four or five values that most human beings share. For example, family, uh, education, health, financial wellness, are usually integrity. These are usually values that most people would share. So I would suggest start with those. You know, are those five values yours or not? If they are, what, what's, what's the most important? You know, and all the studies that they do, and one day I'll find out who they are. They do some great studies. They've discovered that when people ask what matters most to you, 95% say my family. And then when they ask, well, how do you spend your time? Family's got nothing to do with how they spend their time. So do I really value my family the most? I don't know. People, yeah, that's the one thing you have to come to grips with. Because when you have written that constitution, you have created an unbelievable ability to say no. It's a shield. I mean, you're, 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 your constitution becomes a wonderful shield. 
They say, hey, I'm not going to do that. That's not part of my value system. I didn't say this was easy. It's simple, but it is not easy. Great, thanks. So there are a couple of questions coming out uh, or uh, uh, coming up about the games, and I understand that those games are going to be ready within the next month or so. So you could check back with Hiram's website. The other interesting thing I'd like to point out is that Hiram, you share your own personal constitution in the back of the book, so that might be a valuable resource to folks who are trying to write their own. And I should say you mentioned. And thanks for mentioning that, Becky, because people will notice that. I've written my constitution as affirmation, so it sounds like I've already accomplished it, which sounds really arrogant. I haven't, but I, I decided to write it as if I had done it so I'd see what it looked like if I'd done it. Are you with me? So when people read that, that don't be offended that, you know, I haven't done this yet by any chance, but I'm, I'm, I think I'm on the way to getting that done. Fantastic. Um, so I have a question here from Jessie. She's wondering if you would discuss the wheel and spokes for balancing the areas of your life. Well, the, <clears throat> let, me, let me share a definition with you that might be instructive. Inner peace is having balance, harmony, and serenity in our lives achieved through the disciplined closing of gaps. I think that's where we get the inner peace. How do we get it? We, if we don't identify the values, then there's no way we're going to bring closure on that gap. If we don't prioritize the values, then there's no way we're going to experience inner peace because we're going to be giving more time to this than that, and we need to decide, well, does, does loyalty come above integrity? Does family become uh, is more important than physical fitness? You know, I've got to, and, and sometimes there's a very thin line between them, but if I really know what my values are, I've described them in writing, and I know the priority. All of a sudden, I am experiencing balance in my life because I'm giving an equal amount of time to those things that I have said I value. Most people don't know. They, they have values. They think they do, but they, they, don't, they haven't really codified them, so they're not doing anything about it. Got it. Great. Uh, so here's a really insightful question from Randy. He, he's um, referencing what you said at the beginning, that the principles for dealing with um, the world haven't really changed in 6,000 years. But Ray, he's wondering what you've learned or modified in your system over the past 15 to 20 years. Well, as, as far as the system is concerned, the, system is, are, the systems are changing dramatically. For example, we now have digital devices. We have uh, daily task lists that we can do digitally. We can send them around the world. We can send my my calendar out to everybody in the world if I want. So the systems are changing dramatically. However, the basic principles that help me be better organized, that's planning my day, thinking through what really matters most to me, uh, living the, the values that I have committed to. Those kinds of things are time immemorial. They're not time sensitive. They go on forever. And so the more fancy the devices that we have, that's wonderful. I, I saw a movie the other night I thought was wonderful. It was uh, with Matt Damon called The Martian. And this guy just solved problems. And he solved problems with some very old uh, information with new technology. And it was fabulous to watch him do it. And here we are in this amazing world with all this wonderful new technology, but the basic principles that bring inner peace in my life, help my family be better, help us grow and be better people, those principles have been around a very, very long time. Those don't change. The systems change. The principles don't. Great. Thanks so much. I think that's a good place to end. We've absolutely run out of time today, um, and there were other questions that came in. I'll share those with you offline, Hiram. I want to thank everyone for attending. If you're still listening to my voice and you're interested in a free copy of the Three Gaps book today, I have a few I'm going to give away. If you can e email me, Becky at weavinginfluence.com, with your feedback and input about today's event, we'll get a book out to you. Uh, for the rest of you, we would want to encourage you to go today to buy the book at your favorite bookstore or online retailer. And if you've read the book and enjoyed it, we would very greatly appreciate an Amazon review. Um, the other thing that we want you to know is that Hiram has founded a new company called Three Gaps that has corporate learning opportunities available. So if you know someone in an organization who could benefit from these principles uh, coming to their organization, I would encourage you to reach out to Hiram through his website and also visit the Three Gaps website for more information. Hiram, thank you so much for investing your time with us today. Um, and thank best you. wishes for a successful launch of the book.
Thank you very much. Great to be with you. Take care. Bye-bye.